context is everything. Because when I say that something like Umbrella Academy is trash, I mean that as a very high compliment. There's nothing wrong with trash entertainment. It's what I tend to think of instead of using the phrase guilty pleasure, because while the general idea behind guilty pleasure is fine, the wording throws me off. I don't think you should be guilty about anything that brings you joy, so long as it's not something that hurts other people. So I don't see guilt as being something that should be part of your entertainment diet and how you process But that doesn't mean that some things aren't just, they're just not high art. And that's fine. In fact, that can be incredibly fun. And I'll be honest, I've kind of been jonesing for some trash lately. Because I feel like I haven't had good trash. Not to my tastes in a little bit now. Gotham was my go-to trash show for a while, but... That ended, and unfortunately, the final season wasn't even that good. There's other things out there. My partner Liz got into um, Riverdale. Uh, She's quite enjoyed that as a trash show. It's not really my wheelhouse, although I do enjoy her telling me about it. It, God, her recounting the events of that show, that is entertaining in and of itself. But what do I mean by my trash? Well, when we talk about geeky materials there's certainly plenty of options there's lots of fun trashy stuff in the geek sphere every yeah and that's not even new like you could go back to the original conan the barbarian stories that's trash but it's fun trash but i do have a specific particular kind of flavor that's hard for me to define except by comparatives this is not my trash this is not my trash this is not my trash This is my trash. This is my trash. This is my trash. And with its second season, Umbrella Academy very firmly has assumed its place as my current favorite piece of trash entertainment that is going on right now. So what do I mean when I say it's trash? Well, it has a lot to do with a feel. Something that is hard to nail down. It has a lot to do with ambitions or often lack thereof. Because you can get things that are bad that come in a few different flavors. You can get things that are bad but don't realize that they're bad. And that can sometimes manifest in interesting oddities like, say, The Room or Troll 2, where obviously the people making it did not realize they were making utter garbage. You can get things where the people making it know it's trash and really lean into that. That's where you get things like, well, for a recent example, something like the Velocipaster. That's not my jam either. For me, there's a sweet zone right in the middle where it is ridiculous. It knows it's ridiculous, but it doesn't lean on that like a crutch to avoid the you know doing the basic nuts and bolts of competent storytelling but it also doesn't shy away from the fact that it is ridiculous and honestly comic book adaptation is perfect for this kind of trash but it took a long time for it to get there i mean you look back at the comic book adaptations for a long time honestly they were terrified of looking comic booky you actually go outside in these things what would you prefer Yellow spandex. And then you finally got the 2002 Sam Raimi Spider-Man film, which was bright and colorful and showed them, hey, we can do garish. It's all right. But even after that, it was a slow for everyone else to really fully catch up because you would get stuff like Daredevil that was still dour. And even now you still get stuff, you know, desaturated. It's serious. It's dark. It's gritty. Which is not to say that can't be good, but... Comic books are ridiculous. That's part of what's fun about them. And even things that have embraced the ridiculousness, like, say, most of the Marvel movies, will still, they still had their stumbling points with things like, say, Thor the Dark World. But 
you can get into something like, say, Avengers Civil War, which has a lot of emotional weight and it's taken pretty seriously, but at the same time can joke around with characters like Spider-Man and Ant-Man because those characters are fun. And in the case of Ant-Man specifically, ridiculous. And yet at the same time, I don't know if uh, Avengers would have put a monkey butler in there. I know they've got Rocket Raccoon, but he's out in space. He's not on Earth, generally. They don't have to justify him. Not that Umbrella Academy needs to justify its monkey butler. It just has one. Sorry, ape. Ape butler. It just has one. Here's the thing. I saw season one of Umbrella Academy and liked it fine. It didn't become my jam until the second season. I think the main reason for that is the first season, well... The first season really, especially now in hindsight, was just a lot of groundwork laying. It was getting us familiar with these characters, getting us familiar with their interactions, their damage, the world in general, and things going on in the background like with the commission and everything else. But there was a lot of setup, not a ton of plot. We had all these characters established, all the members of the Umbrella Academy, their father, everything going on with the apocalypse. Vanya had a little bit of a plot, but it was slow moving. You had uh, Hazel and um, Cha-Cha, but even they didn't like come in and impact things all that much. For how long that first season was, not a lot happened because it was mostly just acclimating everyone to all this stuff. And that can make for a, okay, first season. But if you build off that properly, it means you can hit the second season running. And this one ran. And it ran with a plot that I didn't think was going to be great. Like I saw the trailer. You can see my trailer reaction. When I saw that it was going to be set in the 60s and we we're going to be dealing with JFK, I was like, oh God, come on. It seems like so many time travel things are like, ooh, can we stop JFK? But like, no, it's, it's great. And it does so many things that I would have thought like, that's a bad idea. Why would you do that? And it makes it work. Or at least it makes it fun breaking the team up so they're not all together again which means we have to have them all finding each other again oh for crying out loud that feels like stalling no because in their different isolated patches they are going to be in new circumstances that is going to show us how they adapt how they adjust or how they fail at that and then as we move forward and we get to see whole new things from some of them allison now has a husband and ray is terrific and amazing and thank god they ditched the friggin' crap with her and luther yes luther's still pining for her because luther's a dope but i'm glad that they stopped doing that i'm glad it was also pointed out in universe like that's weird that 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 mm. And Vanya, I when the season started, I was so... I'm going to try and avoid major spoilers. I'll try and limit this to front half of the second season. But <laughs> with Vanya, the setup of her coming in and not remembering, which is basically a big part of what the reveal was last time. So I'm like, great, we're going to repeat her arc, except we don't. Because her reaction to learning what she, you know, learning similar stuff to what she learned last time is not the same. Her circumstances are not the same. The people she's around are not the same. And so it plays different. It's not a repeated arc. It's taking the characters we knew and doing something different with them, but while keeping all of the absurdity and nonsense. Because these characters, like five, you try and look me in the eye. And tell me that a 12-year-old, or at least physically 12-year-old, time-traveling master assassin who was in love with a mannequin isn't a trashy idea. Because it is. And then there's Klaus. Sexy trash. I relate to Klaus a lot. Some for reasons that cut on the deep side of things. But I just... I. I love that without having to sit down and explain exactly why, you can get pretty quickly, if you think about it for more than a half a second, how hearing dead people, whether he wants to or not, would drive someone to drink. When he ends up in the 60s, he just starts a cult. Until the pressure gets too much, and then he abandons his cult. Klaus is such a mess. He's such an empathetic little bastard. 
who hates his own feelings. I'm sure he would love nothing more than to deaden every feeling he ever has had or ever will have, but he can't. And it's gorgeous and painful and overwrought and beautiful. Alice and I already mentioned she gets way better stuff going on here than she did in the first season, largely because she's decoupled from Luther. And then we've got Ben. And we didn't know all that much about Ben from the first one other than he was dead. Here we learn about Ben. Beyond just his antagonizing class, we learn more about how he thinks and feels about the world and other people, what he's like, what he misses about being alive. Ben was touching my heart by the end. But again, let us not forget, Ben is a ghost who can, so far as I can tell, open a portal to the Elder Gods in his chest. That's horrifying. And it's great. Luther. I mean, Luther's just kind of dull. I won't lie. They did a few interesting things with him, like the whole saying to hell with it after being the big responsible one. Yeah, that's that's fine. That works. Oh, <laughs> he is great when paired off against five, especially in this season. Because I lo- first of all, Luther looks ridiculous, and then five five is the one who takes pretty much all of this the most serious out of anybody, and he looks preposterous. It's so it's so stupid. It's so great. And then Vanya, her arc, her story. This like the first time it actually kind of annoyed me. Because I found the premise of her being the only one who doesn't have powers in this family of people with powers to actually be more interesting the idea of, oh, she's actually the most powerful of them all. But here, the arc just plays so much better. And they do a lot better work with the idea of her being a misfit among this group of misfits. It's solid work. And it's much better use of your Ellen Page than the first one. And then there's Diego and Diego. Diego's just an idiot. Like, I won't lie. If Diego were to drop dead in the next season, I, I, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't exactly be shedding a tear. There's some great terms that get used for him in this season. Imagine Batman, then aim lower. You are an open book written for very dumb children. I actually found myself thinking that Diego is a bit, well. He's a bit Kylo Ren because... Every word of what you just said was wrong. He never does the right or intelligent or even common sense thing ever. He is so stupid and yet so self-righteous. That's the thing. Luther's not that smart either. But Luther seems to accept when other people tell him that he's not doing the right thing. Like, oh, okay, maybe you know better. Diego is so sure of himself and so dumb. I don't think he makes a single sound decision in the entire season. And I can't even remember what he did in the first season enough to say whether he made any sound decisions in that one. And then we get further expansion of their father. And which, again, much like... This is better use of your Ellen Page. Now, we have better use of your Confiore. This thing is a vibe. It's a feel. And Gotham really is my go-to comparison for this. This is bonkers characters in a bonkers world dealing with dark stakes and heavy themes and things that honestly feel like they shouldn't be mixed with stuff this ridiculous or characters this stupid and i don't just mean diego like klaus is an idiot too i feel for him but he's an idiot and luther's a bit of an idiot allison she's not stupid but she's definitely uh matt had her questionable decisions five seems to have it together but boy is he rash and like these people that just keep stumbling over each other in the way that my favorite pieces of trash media do And I am so happy with this second season. I don't, here's the thing. I don't know if I'd ever actually go back and watch the first season again. But I will rewatch the crap out of this. It's so much fun. I hope you watched it. And if you didn't, I did not spoil major plot points of the second season. I did a little bit for the first season. But, you know, hopefully you've seen that. 
Alrighty. Now this is another case where I don't have a sponsor, although I do have a Patreon, help me out, I'd appreciate it. But so where I would maybe put a sponsorship plug instead, I am going to shout out a creative who I think folks should look into and would have fun with. And I'm going to pick another cosplayer this time. So if you go to Instagram and look up Sarah and Dippity cosplays, probably said all together serendipity cosplays, but you know, spelled like, like that, you will find a fantastic cosplayer with a great variety of work. A lot of it is very fun. She's just got a great presence. She does enchanting. She does scary. She does gender bending. I mean, yeah, so I'm going to be a sucker for that. Check out her stuff. Follow her on Instagram. And I think you'll have a good time seeing her work pop up in your feed. So that's it for this one. Umbrella Academy Season 2. You've seen it. What'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let us talk about it. You know all the stuff. I mentioned the Patreon already. Keeps the lights on. Much appreciated. Plus, a bunch of other stuff. Like, subscribe, share. All of which help me out uh, in its own way. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Because you're the council and I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. I heard a rumor that you supported me on Patreon and like, shared, subscribed, and hit the bell. Had to try.